why were you born? Like, what is the purpose of your life? Like, why are you here? Um, Solomon, uh, years ago, and Solomon is touted to be in the Old Testament, the wisest man who ever lived, um, he poses this question in the book of Ecclesiastes, which is a, is a difficult book uh, uh, to, to read and to study. I was preaching through it before I uh, accepted this job. I think I got to like chapter three, and it proved to be one of the more difficult books to preach, uh, but, a, but a most profound book because Solomon is asking uh, the most important question in life, which is, why am I here? What is my purpose as a human being? Uh, and he, he was a king. He was a very powerful king. He was a very wealthy king. Uh, and he had all of that power and money at his disposal to pursue uh, purpose in life. And so if you study his book, uh, he pursued uh, purpose in all the things that everybody looks for purpose in. He pursued purpose in uh, wine, women, wealth, and work. Read the book. Those are the things that he looked at. And we all know that he had more than one wife. Uh, in fact, I think he had probably too many wives. So his, the question is, you know, if I have a thousand wives, will that make me happy? Answer, no, no, no. And if you're talking to your computer right now, that's okay. Uh, uh, no, thousand wives, thousand husbands, not gonna make you happy. Um, he's like, well, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm a connoisseur with wine, I understand all the wines, I know all their names, I drink them all, I have a, a really great wine palate, is that gonna give purpose and meaning? Answer, no. So he goes down through each of these things. He pours himself into building projects and builds a magnificent buildings. And he finds at the end of the day that he says they're just vanity. Uh, the Hebrew word is hebel. Hebel in Hebrew means uh, wind. And he says, as I strove for these things, it was like I, I reached out with my hand and I grabbed wine, women, wealth, and work. And I had my fill of it, but then I opened my hand to see what I had there, if I had any purpose there. And he said it was, it was nothing like, it was just hebel. It was, it was like wind. There was nothing there. It was a hollowness and a vanity. Um, in chapter 12, uh, it's the conclusion of his book. Uh, so he builds the entire book to a climax in chapter 12, where he answers the question that he poses in the first chapter. And in verse 13, here's what he says is the conclusion of his quest for purpose. It says the conclusion, when all has been heard, is two things. Number one, fear God. Fear God. Second, keep his commandments. Why? Well, because this applies to every person, every person, doesn't matter who you are. These two concepts are applicable to you. Why are you here? Well, Paul, uh, 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 Solomon uh, says, well, I'm here to do two things, and you are here to do two things. God made you to do two things. Number one, fear him, reverence him. Number two, keep the commandments that he's articulated in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. That's why you're here. Now, some would say in our uh, individualistic, uh, uh, self-centered, uh, selfish world, they would say, well, well, why should I fear God? Well, uh, he answers that question in verse 14, because I'm sure he had heard that before himself. So he gives you the ultimate motivation in verse 14 as to why you, who were created to fear God, should obey his commandments. He says in verse 14, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil, you know, this could be a whole other sermon, but just as a side note, I would think if our culture ever wrapped its mind around those two concepts, I was created to fear God Almighty and obey what he's called me to do. And why should I do that? Because one day, all the things I have ever said or done, either known or unknown, all gets revealed when I stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with God Almighty, and he will, he will then judge me at that point. That's the ultimate motivation for fearing God and being obedient. That would transform our entire culture if everybody from professors, police, politicians, you know, people that work at the bank, if, if everybody understood that I am made to reverence God who created me and that reverence for God in turn leads to a heart that obeys him, you would have justice and peace, would you not? But I must stop and ask as a pastor, because it's, it's kind of my job. I'd be remiss in my job as a pastor if I didn't ask you, are, are you ready to stand before God who will bring all your life into judgment? Are you ready? Because you'll stand before him in one of two ways. Either you'll stand before him covered by the blood of Christ as his child, and he will, he will usher you into heaven, or you will stand there on your own, no sins covered by the blood of Christ. The only way to get ready for that day is to say, God, save me, and he will save you and redeem you. Long before Solomon uh, started on that journey as to why am I here, uh, his dad, David, King David, uh, had the same kind of questions. 
Uh, and those questions are, are basically articulated in Psalm 8. Psalm 8. I told you we weren't going to do every psalm because we would be in the psalms at the rate I moved through them uh, for probably the rest of my pastoral career. So we're going to skip around here and there. Uh, so we're going to do Psalm 8 today because it is a powerful uh, passage on what is my life's purpose? Why am I here? Let's read it. See what David has to say. David says, this is for the choir director on the Gatith. It's a Psalm of David. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy of the revengeful cease. He says, you know, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have ordained, what is man? What is man that you take thought of him? I mean, God, you're in control of the entire cosmos and you spend time thinking about us? We'll get to that in a couple weeks. I told you I wasn't gonna move fast through Psalm 8. It says, what is a man that you take thought of him, the son of man that you, you would care for him? You have made him a little lower than, and, than God. Some translations read angels. And you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the pass of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth, all of the earth. This is an amazing psalm, uh, which tells us uh, what our purpose is in life. And I don't want to move through it quickly, as I just said, uh, as you're probably accustomed uh, to my methodology. Um, I think we're only going to do about two verses today, uh, because the content is so amazing. And we've got to really understand this, because if you go through life and don't understand what your purpose is, well, then you have to fulfill what God wants for you. And I, and I know the majority do not know what their divine purpose is, and that's what this is about. He first says that this is a psalm written to the choir director. This is the choir director at the temple. And David says, when, it, when I wrote this psalm, he said, I wrote it that, that you would play it on the gatith. Gatith. Now, if I told you, you know, I wrote this song, Marty, so you to play on the electric keyboard, we'd all know what that is. If I said it, I wrote it to play it on electric guitar, we'd all know what that is. Um, gatith is not the ancient version of a Stratocaster. Uh, that's not what it is. And if you don't know what a Stratocaster is, um, look it up on Wiki, uh, Wikipedia. It'll probably tell you. It's an amazing guitar. What this is, uh, this particular instrument, was like a, like a flute. Uh, and a flute, if you th can think about a flute, I've tried to play them before. I, I played the trombone in, uh, when I was younger in school, in marching band and stuff, in addition to the piano. But I tried the flute, those kind of wind instruments. Not for me. I just couldn't get the sound to come out like I wanted. But a flute, when somebody knows how to really play it, as a friend of mine did, it's a very melodious thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a joyous thing. And so however they sang this song, the mu musical notation that went with the song was played on a flute during a worship service. And everybody would have known this song, Psalm 8. It's a happy song. Why is it happy? Because God's telling you what your purpose is. And, and until you find out why God made you, you're not going to be happy. You'll be like Solomon. Well, I've tried all these women. I'm on my, you know, I'm on my fifth wife, you know, but I'm still not happy. You know, I had a lady come into my office one time when I was a new pastor, and she sat, she sat down and shut down her husband down, and she handed me a multi-page document. I mean, numbered, pages, front and back, pages, like five pages uh, of, of stuff. And I said, what's this? And she said, well, this is my fifth husband. And she said, these are all the reasons why I don't want to stay married to him. And I want you as the pastor to look through them uh, and, and tell him how he can get his act together so I'll be happy with him. <laughs> yeah. I started reading them. Uh, one of them was, when he comes home from work, he takes his boots off and he leaves them next, side the, next to the bedside. That's why you want to divorce him? How many men leave their shoes next to the bed? Uh, when, it, when there's leaves in the yard, um, he uh, doesn't go out and rake them right away and leaves them all over the yard. Um, that's another reason why I want to leave him. Huh? I said, hey, you know, uh, I live for raking leaves. Most guys do not live for raking leaves. Not a valid idea. See, this lady was on to husband number five, but she wasn't happy. But if she would ever come to terms with God and what God wanted her to do, then, she, then she'd be happy. So when we think about David, he's telling you, let's sing this beautiful song as to why we should be happy. Point one, he tells you, my purpose, when you look at your life purpose and define happiness, is to realize who God is. That's why you're made. 
Not to realize who you are, or I've got to go find myself, uh, but it's to realize who God is. Notice what he says. He says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth, who have displayed your splendor above in the heavens. And then he says, from the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. And then he closes in verse 9 with what he said in verse 1. He repeats himself. He says, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Why do you do that? Well, uh, it's a rhetorical device uh, in Hebrew called inclusio. Inclusio. It means how you start is how you finish. And a lot of pastors do this when they prepare a sermon. They'll pose a question, and then they'll come back and pose that same kind of question and answer it at the end. This is called inclusio. It's an it's a, it's a oratorical device. And it's like a, I had a professor one time liken it to a beautiful bow that you wrap on a package. You can't help but see it. Which tells you what's important to the psalmist. Well, what's important to the psalmist is verse 1 and verse 9. Where he says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. That's the focus. That's the focus. Because that's telling you what your purpose is. I mean, think about it. Uh, I just read this book... Uh, Yes, I do relax on vacation by reading. Uh, I read for a living, but I, I love to read. And so I read uh, Hugh Ross's book, Why the Universe is the Way That It Is. Uh, he's an astronomer, uh, and he has a PhD from the University of Toronto. He's, he's a fine mind in, in uh, astronomy. Uh, and, and some of the book was like past me, but most of it was like, man, that is totally amazing. Uh, and I read the science book, and, and, I, and I just worship God as I was reading this book up at the lake. Um, because when you look at the size of our, of our uh, Milky Way galaxy, and you look at the size of the cosmos at large, I mean, we're just like a pinhead off to the side in the immensity of all of this. And in all of that, and on that little insignificant planet, which I told Liz the other day as we were sitting in lawn chairs, because uh, our kids went back, they had to finish the school on Tuesday. So we stayed Tuesday by ourselves, uh, Lake Tahoe, um, right on the beach at our friend's place. And uh, and just had some alone time, and we didn't get to really do anything on our 40th anniversary, so that was kind of it. Uh, but as we're sitting there, I told Liz, it's like, wow, this beautiful lake. You know, it's like 15, 1,600 feet deep. The water's so crystal clear, that blue turquoise. I said, could you imagine in all of the cosmos, of all of the galaxies, and there's water like this on one planet? Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's not by accident that God put us here. You know, if, if we are here in this insignificant little planet, like what's, what's our life supposed to be about? Well, David tells you what your life is about. It's focusing on who God is. Now, how do you know who God is? Well, he tells you by, who God is by the words that he uses. He says, O oh Lord, our Lord. Uh, the first Lord is capital L-O-R-D. And the next Lord is capital L, small, small O-R-D. This is most significant. He uses two names for God which tells you like who God is. Uh, and these are emphatic in the Hebrew text uh, because these words uh, are not supposed to occur first. The verb is supposed to come first in the Hebrew text, but the verb's not first. He says, Yahweh Adonai Nu, our Lord. Yahweh, our Lord. He's so overcome with who God is, he, he puts him at the front of the sentence like a speed bump and says, no, no, you gotta focus on who God is. He's majestic. Other translations say his name is excellent. It's excellent. Lord, uh, in the Hebrew text, uh, capital L-O-R-D, uh, is uh, Yahweh. Uh, it comes from the verb hava, to be. Uh, God is majestic and God is excellent. His name is excellent as Yahweh because he's the eternal one. That, that's the verb to be. I mean, this is the, the name that, that God gave to Moses uh, at, the, at, at the burning bush in Exodus chapter th uh, uh, 3, verse 14. When he says, who, who do I say has, has sent me? And God says, tell them I am has sent you. It's the eternal one. He's, he's the eternal one. He has eternal existence. You know, he's the God that exists outside of time and space, as we said many times before. I mean, he's the God who, he, since he's eternally existent, he created cause and effect. Because there's no such thing as, as self-causation. God, who's eternal, created cause and effect as a chain. He's the actualized one. He's purely actualized. As God, Dr. Norman Geisler used to tell me all the time, God is purely actualized. There's nothing about him that's potential. We, on the other hand, are potentially actualized. 
We're dependent beings. He's an independent being, dependent on no one. That's why he picks this name, O Lord, Lord, the eternally existent one. The first time this word appears uh, in the Old Testament is in, is in the Torah, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, where it says this. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, God, Elohim, uh, made the heaven and the earth. I made the earth and the heaven. This is the first time this is used in the Old Testament, this concept of God being the great eternal one. And he uses it in relationship to Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden to tell them basically, I, as I put you in this perfect garden, am the eternally existent one who put you in that garden. I am moral and I am holy. And I, I just want one thing from you. Do not eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Enjoy the rest of the garden, all the other trees. I just want you and your free will not to exercise it and eat that tree, any fruit of that tree. See, he's the eternally existent one. He just wanted them to worship him and obey him. We know what happened. They did not obey him, but that's what he wanted. His name is excellent. Why? Because he's eternally always there. His name is, is beyond all names. You know, you have to ask yourself, if I, I've asked myself since I was a little kid, why is there something as opposed to nothing? Why? Uh, why is there order and specified complexity as opposed to disorder and chaos? I mean, if evolution is true and there was a big bang, I mean, why do we have so much specified complexity? Why is there not total chaos in the cosmos? Well, because there's Yahweh, the eternally existent one. That's why his name is most excellent, most excellent. Uh, Sir Peter Medawar uh, talks about the limits of science when he makes this statement as a scientist. He says this, the existence of a, of a limit to science is however made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions having to do with first and last things. Questions such as, how did everything begin? What are we all here for? What is the point of living? See, science can't answer those questions, but it arrogantly thinks it can. Peter Adkins, uh, English chemist who is a fellow at, uh, at uh, Lincoln College in the University of Oxford says this, says, quote, there is no reason to suppose that science cannot deal with every aspect of existence. Well, I'm sad to say, but uh, there is major limitations to science. Science can only tell you what is. It can't tell you why it is. It can't tell you what you ought to do. I mean, if, you, if you're flying on an airplane, as I was yesterday for five hours, with a mask on for five hours, that, that was not fun. You feel like you're suffocating the entire time. Um, but, but if you take your mask off and you start coughing, um, you're going to have a whole lot of people looking at you. And if you have the COVID virus, you can probably say, if I cough, I'm going to probably give it to all of them. So should I take my mask off? Answer, no, no. But what tells me what I ought to do in that situation does not come from science. Science can only tell me if I cough on somebody and I have a virus, I can potentially give them the virus. It doesn't tell me if I should morally take my mask off or not. Limits of science. See, when we look at the name of God, his name is the eternally existent one. He gives the, the reason for our morality, why we feel things are right and feel things are wrong, because we can measure them against him who is eternally absolute. God's name is, as Yahweh is majestic and excellent uh, because it serves as the bedrock of science. Uh, because he is eternally existent and predictable and rational, then science can be predictable and rational. Mel, uh, Melvin Calvin, Nobel Peace Prize winner in biochemistry, wrote this. He says, as I try to discern the origin that, of that conviction that science would not be possible without order, I seem to find it in the basic notion discovered 2,000 to 3,000 years ago and enunci uh, enunciated first in the Western world by the ancient Hebrews. What did they say? Namely, that the universe is governed by a single God, and it is not the product of the whims of many gods, each governing in his own province according to his own laws, this monotheistic view seems to be the historical foundation of modern science. And it is. See, you couldn't have science if you didn't have predictability. He says, I am a chemist. And he says, I, I've won the Nobel Peace Prize because I can study the cosmos at a chemistry level and understand it because there's a God who made it, who's a God of order, who made the order of chemistry. Smart man. God's name is most excellent because he is the God behind all of these things. Then we must say, based on the fact that God is the eternally existent one, then there, there has to be a designer behind the complexity of the things that we see. Michael Behe is, a, is a, another biochemist. Uh, 
very smart man, a godly man, who looks at the order and studies it and finds God. He says this about irreducible complexity when it comes to the great eternal God. He says irreducible, irreducible complexity is just a fancy phrase that I use to mean a single system which is uh, composed of several interchanging parts and where the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to cease functioning. He says think of a car's complex engine for instance. Can it work without a piston? No. A spark plug? No. Or can it work without a carburetor? No. He says, an irreducibly complex system cannot be produced directly by numerous successive slight modifications of a precursor system because any precursor system to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functioning. Man, I read this stuff and it's like, how can you not see the fingerprints of God? See, because he's the eternally existent one, the rational one, the orderly one. And he designed all this complexity that we see that you can't even have a car, car missing a piston and it function correctly. He goes into great detail in, uh, in the rest of his book, if you would like to read about it, uh, where he, he talks about just the intricacies of the, of the human system, how it's all interwoven together. It could not have happened in stages. That's a, a chemist that sees the fingerprints of God and all that is made. And, and, and Behi can, can look at these great things that God has made and say his name is excellent because he's above the complexity that, that we see. And he's easy to see. D uh, David calls him, O oh Lord, the eternal one. And then says he, he then calls him by the name Lord, L-O-R-D. Uh, this is the word Adonai. This is the relationship between a, a servant uh, and a king. Uh, and, and, and the scriptures pick this up in the Old Testament and the New Testament that we are, who are created by God are called to look upon him as the Lord, the, the master, and we are here to serve him. He says, oh Lord, our Lord, our Adonai, our Lord, saying, David's basically saying, I, I'm your servant. The first time this word appears is in Genesis chapter 15, verse two. It says, Abraham said to God, oh Lord, Adonai, uh, he says, O Lord God, which is that particular word is Elohim there. What will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? If you study the context, uh, he, uh, Abraham has just uh, gone to deliver Lot, who was uh, taken captive by some uh, wicked warriors. And he is, he is in his old age, uh, has gone up in, uh, to the north of Israel and delivered uh, his, his nephew. Uh, and that's in chapter 14. And he comes back through Jerusalem and he pays the tithe. Uh, till Melchizedek, uh, the king, uh, the priest of Jerusalem, uh, who, who is a great Christ type in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And after that particular uh, gift that he gives to God uh, in worship of God for giving him a victory, he asks God this question. God, when are you going to bless my life with the promised son so I can carry out the Abrahamic covenant? When, when are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? He says, oh Lord, you're Adonai. You're the, you're the king and I'm merely a servant. See, it's a proper relationship. He's thinking of himself as the one who serves God. And God promises, if you keep on reading, that he'll, he'll give uh, him, he'll bless him and his wife in their old age with a son, uh, and that promised son will be Isaac, will be Isaac. You know, it's this, this particular title uh, was naturally applied to Jesus, Lord, L-O-R-D, Lord, because he's the king of kings and we are but his servants. Uh, Paul uses it in Colossians 2, verse 6, where he says this, he says, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. That Lord, uh, I believe in the Greek text, that's kurios, which is a equivalent to the Old Testament, Adonai. He says, therefore, if you've received Christ Jesus, like if you have moved uh, from darkness to light, if you've embraced the gospel of Christ, if he's your Lord, then what's the natural byproduct? You walk in him. What's that mean? Well, that means whatever he taught, that's what I do. And that's what I do. I study my Lord so I can look at my life to say, does my life reflect his? Again, I would say when I look at my poor culture and all, all the complexities and all the sadness and all the chaos, wouldn't it all end if they just came to terms with that one little verse? Jesus is my Lord, and I just try to live like him. It would change everything, change everything. Walk to be in love with the Lord. Life's purpose is directly related to doing these two things, understanding who God is, and who is he? He's the eternally existent one. He's Yahweh. And he's, he's the Lord. He's the master. And we are but the servants to follow his, his teachings. You have to ask yourself, is he my Lord? 
Because he's either your Lord or he's not your Lord. Is he your Lord? Acts chapter 16, verse 31, uh, when uh, Paul and uh, I think it was Titus were in jail, uh, uh, God sent an angel to free them. Uh, and all the, the cell doors opened, and there was an earthquake, a scary night for the people running the jail. And the Philippian jailer uh, went to, to Paul uh, and Silas, and he said to them, um, what must I do uh, to be saved? He got it right. What must I do to be saved? And what did Paul tell him? He says, believe in the Lord. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you shall be saved. And he did. See, that, that's written for you. Because you, like him, got, maybe God has, has taken some of the tragedies in our country over the last couple of months, the virus, the riots, the, all the things that we've seen, and maybe God's rattling in your cage, and he's saying, but do you know me? Am I your Lord? Because when he's your Lord, then everything comes to center, and then there's peace. There's peace. To those who really wonder, well, how, how do I really know that there's Yahweh? How do, how do I really know that there's an eternally existent God who's actually out there? Um, he says, you know, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Well, how do I know that there's a God that's really there? Well, notice what the last part of the verse says. Who have displayed your splendor above in the heavens. What's that mean? Well, that means all you have to do is look up and you can see the handprint of God. That's all you have to do. I mean, if I, ha if I could have free time in my life, I would read a whole lot more books on uh, astronomy. I love astronomy. I have, I have books like astronomy books on my coffee table at home. I mean, I love astronomy, uh, but I don't have a whole lot of time to study it because when I do study it, it shows me the greatness of God. Why would I say God's name is majestic? How do I know he's actually there? Well, because he's displayed himself through natural revelation. I'll give you a couple ideas to think about. Who cannot look at the clock-like work of the movement of the stars and not conclude that there's a God behind the clockwork? Liz and I went out the other night uh, when we were in Lake Tahoe by ourselves, Tuesday night, late at night, walked out onto the, the back uh, deck of the upstairs bedroom facing the lake. <clears throat> Beautiful night. Lake Tahoe, there's no light refraction. And I went out first. She's like, what are you doing? I'm going, you gotta come out here. So she came out there and we both looked up. It was like, she's, the first thing she said was like, whoa, well, what do we see? Thousands and thousands of stars. Thousands, I mean, directly above the condo was the, the Big Dipper. And I told her, it's the fingerprint of God. That you can come out here and study these things, uh, and who can't see in that predictable understanding of these things that there's a God who designed all that clockwork. Who can't look at the waxing and waning of the moon, which we did while we were there, and not understand that this was predicted by, but God predicted this. He made this to happen. Because when we first got there, it was a full moon. Um, we were jet lagged when we first got there. We got up one night about two or three in the morning. Uh, we had the windows open facing the lake because the big windows, hey, you just, what better way to go to bed at night? Looking at the lake, huge plate glass windows. You could see the full moon over the lake. It's gorgeous. You know, by the time we left, it was starting to wane a little bit, but that's so predictable, so predictable. I don't know what it does for you, but when I look out at that beautiful moon, I don't just look out and go, oh, that's great. No, I look at that and I say, oh, there's a God. There's a God in his majesty who put that there. I read a lot this, uh, this last week on astronomy. One, one of the things I want to share with you is just um, on a given night, I grew up in the desert, on a given night in the desert, uh, Scientists say that with the naked eye, you can see about 3,000 stars if you start counting them. Now, I grew up in the desert, so you could really see the stars. I loved it there because there's not a lot of light refraction. 3,000 stars, that's just with the naked eye. But start looking at this, what the Hubble telescope shoots. Millions and millions of stars. It's estimated uh, that in our galaxy alone, there's 100 billion stars. I would like to meet the scientists that did all that counting. That must have been a great PhD dissertation. You know, a hundred billion stars. What is man that you are mindful of him? Well, God loves man. And he put all that beauty up there for you to study. Nebulas are those particular things in our cosmos that make stars. Uh, I want to show one to you, uh, the Orion Nebula. It's an amazing nebula. Uh, it is 30 light years in diameter. 30 light years in diameter is the uh, Orion Nebula. Uh, and if you... Light traveling basically 186,000 miles per second, which would be 6 trillion miles in a year, it would take 30 years to cross the width 
of one nebula. And that's one nebula of many nebulae that are out in the world that God has made. And they're up there to show us what? The glory of God, the power of God, the mind of God, the intricacy of God, the mathematics of God, the logic of God, the glory of God. See, they're all there. See, a fool looks up and sees nothing. But the wise man looks up and says, no, I can see the God who made these things. I'm without excuse then when I stand before him because I had enough evidence to point me to him. I like verse two. It says, from the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you've established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy of the revengeful cease. Now I know you're probably reading that verse thinking, what in the world does that mean? That's one of those cryptic verses. It's like, huh? I, I don't know. I think it's kind of a cool verse because here, here's what he, I think he's saying. He just told you that God's fingerprints are all over the cosmos. And now he's going to tell you, even a child, even a child can understand that there is a God. They know it in their heart. It's built into the fabric of their being. As they get older, they get clever as sinners and devise all kinds of vacuous arguments to argue against God. But a little child has a simplicity in their mind. They understand that there's a greatness beyond that which they see. And that greatness is God. I mean, I, my mom uh, worked with children in children's ministry for many years, even when I was a little kid. And uh, we were talking about it the other day, all the songs that she taught me as a kid. You know, as a kid, you sing those songs and you understand the theology of them to be true because you understand as a child in your innocence, there's a God. There's a God. Uh, here's, a, here's an oldie moldy. Um, he's got the whole world in his hands. That's an old one we sang when I was a kid. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. And indeed he does. Because as a child you can understand there has to be a God who holds all this in place. There's a, the little song, Jesus loves me, this I know. How do I know it? For the Bible told me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak. But he's what? He's strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. You know, I never ever questioned that he did. I, I always knew he did. And I, I never really questioned that he was there because I knew he was there from the things that I saw. And the little songs that I sang illustrated the essence of Psalm chapter 8, verse 2, that even a child in their innocence knows there's a God because they ask you questions like, Mommy, where do we come from? Mommy, who made God? Who made God? Well, God wasn't made, honey. He, he always was. He's Yahweh. There was another little song we sang when I was a kid. I've got the joy, joy, joy. Where is it? Down in my heart. Why is it down in your heart? Well, when you know Christ as Yahweh and as your Lord, you got joy. And when you got joy, well, you got peace. And if you got peace, you've got justice. And you've got everything that our culture is begging for. But I can tell you where they get it. They get it at the feet of the Lord God in no place else. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. Uh, Psalm 8, such a powerful psalm. And that's why we're going to move slowly through it so that we can each understand our purpose of why you made us. And for those who are uh, listening and watching this service who don't understand why they were made, uh, who struggle, who might be full of a lot of anger, who might be hopeless, we pray that you would, through this sermon, show them the need to have childlike faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ who died for their sins, rose the third day to give them forgiveness and life which can only can come from his good hand might they pause to pray this day god save me and we know you will and for we who know you might we live each day with great purpose in light of what you have done to create us and may we live lives that truly fear you and reflect you in christ's name amen